Welcome to lesson five, and we'll be talking about ethics for data science, and this corresponds to chapter three of the book. I've also uh, um, just taught a six-week version of this course. I'm currently teaching an eight-week version of this course, and we'll release uh, some, some combination or subset of that as a uh, Fast AI and USF ethics for data science class if you want more detail uh, coming in July. I am Rachel Thomas. I am the founding director of the Center for Applied Data Ethics at the University of San Francisco and also co-founder of Fast AI together with Jeremy Howard. Um, my background, I have a PhD in math and worked as a data scientist and software engineer in the tech industry and then have been working at USF and uh, on Fast AI for the past four years now. So ethics issues are in the news. Um, uh, these uh, these articles, I think, are all from this fall, um, kind of showing up at this this intersection of how um, how technology is impacting our world in many kind of increasingly powerful ways, uh, many of which really raise raise concerns. And I want to start by talking about three cases that I hope everyone working in technology knows about and is on the lookout for. So even if you only watch five minutes of this video, these are kind of the the three three cases I want you to see. And one is feedback loops. And so. If Feedback loops can occur whenever your model is controlling the next round of data you get. So the data that's returned quickly becomes flawed by the software itself. And this, this can show up in many places. Uh, one example is with recommendation systems. And so recommendation systems are ostensibly about predicting what content the user will like, but they're also determining what content the user is even exposed to and helping determine what, uh, what has a chance of becoming popular. And so um, YouTube has gotten a lot of, a lot of attention about this um, for kind of um, highly recommending many conspiracy theories, uh, many kind of very damaging conspiracy theories. There is also, uh, they've uh, kind of put together recommendations of pedophilia uh, picked out of what were kind of innocent home movies, but when are kind of strung together, ones that uh, happen to have uh, young girls in bathing suits or, or um, in their pajamas. Um, so there's some really, uh, really concerning uh, results, and this is not something that any anybody intended, and we'll talk about this more later. Um, I think particularly for many of us coming from a science background, we're often used to thinking of like, oh, you know, like we observe the data, um, but really whenever you're building products that interact with the real world, you're also um, kind of controlling what the data looks like. Second, uh, second case study I want everyone to know about um, comes from software that's used to determine poor people's health benefits. It's used in over half of the 50 states. And The Verge did an investigation on what happened when it was rolled out in Arkansas. And what happened is there was a bug in the software implementation that incorrectly cut coverage for people with cerebral palsy or diabetes. Um, including Tammy Dobbs, who's pictured here and was interviewed in the article. Um, and so uh, these are people that really needed this health care, and it was erroneous, erroneously cut due to this bug. And so they were really, um, and they couldn't get any sort of explanation, and there was no appeals or recourse process in place. And eventually this all came out through a lengthy court case, uh, but it's something where it caused a lot, of, a lot of suffering in the meantime. And so it's really important to implement systems with a way to identify and address mistakes and to do that quickly and in a way that hopefully minimizes damage, because we all know software can have bugs, our code can behave in unexpected ways, and we need to be prepared for that. I wrote more about this idea in a post uh, two years ago, what HBR gets wrong about algorithms and bias. And then third case study that everyone should know about. Um, so this is LaTanya Sweeney, who's director of the Data Privacy Lab at Harvard. She has a PhD in computer science. And she noticed several years ago that when you Google her name, you would get these ads saying LaTanya Sweeney arrested, um, implying that she has a criminal record. She's the only LaTanya Sweeney, and she has never been arrested. She paid $50 to the background check company and confirmed that she's never been arrested. She tried Googling some other names, and she noticed, for exa example, Kristen Lindquist got much more neutral ads ju that just say, we found Kristen Lindquist, even though Kristen Lindquist has been arrested three times. And so being a computer scientist, Dr. Sweeney did, 
studied this very systematically. She looked at over 2,000 names and found that this pattern held in which uh, uh, disproportionately African-American names were getting these ads suggesting that the person had a criminal record regardless of whether they did. And uh, traditionally European-American or white names were getting more neutral ads. And this problem of um, kind of bias in advertising shows up a ton. Advertising is kind of the um, uh, profit model for most of the major tech platforms. And it kind of continues to pop up in high impact ways. Just last year, there was research showing how Facebook's ad system discriminates even when the person placing the ad is not trying to do so. So for instance, the same housing ad, exact same text, if you change the uh, photo between a white family and a black family, it's served to very different audiences. Um, and so this is something that can really impact people when they're looking for housing, when they're applying for jobs, um, and is a, is a definite area of concern. So now I want to kind of step back and ask why, why does this matter? Um, and so a very uh, kind of extreme, extreme example is just that data collection has played a, a pivotal role in several genocides. Um, including including the Holocaust. And so this is a photo of Adolf Hitler meeting with the CEO of IBM at the time. I think this photo was taken in 1937. Um, and IBM uh, uh, continued to partner with the Nazis uh, kind of long past when many other companies broke their ties. Uh, they produced um, computers that were used in concentration camps to code um, whether people were Jewish, uh, how they were executed. Um, and this is also um, different from now where you might sell somebody a computer and then never hear from them again. Um, these machines require a lot of maintenance and kind of ongoing relationship with vendors uh, to kind of upkeep and repair them. It's something that a Swiss judge ruled. Um, it does not thus seem unreasonable to deduce that IBM's technical assistance facilitated the task of the Nazis in the commission of their crimes against humanity, acts also involving accountancy and classification by IBM machines and utilized in the concentration camps themselves. I'm told that they haven't gotten around to apologizing yet. Oh, that's... I guess they've been busy. Terrible too, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and so this is a very um, kind of... a very sobering example, um, but I think it's important to, to keep in mind um, kind of what can go wrong and how technology can be used for, for harm, um, for very, very terrible harm. Um, and so this just kind of raises a question, questions that we all need to grapple with of how would you feel if you discovered that you had been part of a system that ended up hurting society? Would you, would you even know? Uh, would you be open to finding out um, kind of how, how things you had built may have been harmful? Um, and how can you help make sure this doesn't happen? And so I think these are questions that we all, all need to grapple with. Um, it's also important to think about unintended consequences, um, how your tech could be uh, used or misused, whether that's by um, harassers, by authoritarian governments, um, for propaganda or disinformation. And then on a kind of a more concrete level, um, you could even end up in jail. And so uh, there was a Volkswagen engineer who got prison time uh, for his role in the diesel cheating case. Um, so if you remember, this is where Volkswagen was cheating on emissions test and one of the kind of uh, programmers that was a part of that. Um, and that person was just following orders from what their boss told them to do. But that is not, uh, not a good excuse for, for doing something that's unethical um, and so something to, to be aware of. Um, so ethics is the, the discipline dealing with what's good and bad. It's a set of moral principles. Um, it's, it's not a set of answers, um, but it's kind of learning what sort of, uh, what sort of questions to ask and even how to, to weigh these decisions. Um, and I'll say some more about uh, kind of ethical foundations and different ethical philosophies later, later on in this lesson. But first I'm gonna kind of start with some, some use cases. Um, ethics is not the same as religion, laws, social norms, or feelings, although it does have overlap with all these things. Um, it's not a fixed set of rules. Um, it's well-founded standards of right and wrong. And this is something where uh, 
clearly not everybody agrees on the ethical action in, in every case, but uh, that doesn't mean that kind of anything goes or that all actions are considered e equally ethical. Uh, there are many things that are widely agreed upon, um, and there are kind of a, a philosophical uh, philosophical underpinnings for kind of making these decisions. And ethics is also the ongoing study and development of our ethical standards. It's a kind of never ending process of learning to um, kind of uh, practice our ethical wisdom. And I'm going to uh, refer it several times to, so here I'm referring to a few articles from the Marcula Center for, uh, for Tech Ethics at Santa Clara University. Um, in particular, the work of Shannon Valor, Brian Green, and Irina Reku has, is fantastic, and they have a lot of resources, um, some of which I'll circle back to later, uh, later in this talk. I spent years of my life studying ethics. It was my major at university, and so much time on the question of what is ethics. I think my takeaway from that is studying the philosophy of ethics was not particularly helpful in learning about ethics. <laughs> yes, and I, w I will try to keep this kind of very, uh, very applied and very uh, practical, also very kind of tech industry specific of what uh, what do you need in terms of applied ethics. In the yeah, my caller said it's great. They somehow they take stuff that I thought was super dry and turn it into useful checklists and things. Um, I did want to note, uh, this was uh, really neat. So Casey Fiesler is a professor at University of Colorado that I really admire. And she created a crowdsourced spreadsheet of tech ethics syllabi. Uh, this was maybe two years ago and got over 200 uh, syllabi entered into this uh, this crowdsource spreadsheet. And then she did a meta analysis on them of uh, kind of looking at all sorts of aspects of the syllabi and what's being taught and how it's being taught. Um, uh, and published a paper on it. What do we teach when we teach tech ethics? Um, and it, a few interesting things about it is it raises there are a lot of uh, <laughs> ongoing discussions and lack of agreement on how to how to best teach tech ethics. Uh, should it be a standalone course versus worked into every course in the curriculum? Um, who should teach it? A computer scientist, a philosopher, or a sociologist? And, and she analyzed for the syllabi uh, what was the course home and the instructor home. And you can see that the, uh, the instructors came from a range of courses, uh, including computer, or a, a range of disciplines, computer science, information science, philosophy, science and tech studies, engineering, law, math, business. Uh, what topics to cover? A huge range of topics that can be covered, um, including law and policy, privacy and surveillance, inequality, justice and human rights. Uh, environmental impact, AI and robots, <laughs> professional ethics, work and labor, cybersecurity, the list goes on and on. Um, and so this is clearly more than can be covered in any, even a full semester length course, um, and certainly not in uh, uh, kind of a single, single lecture. Um, what learning outcomes? The, this is an area where there's a little bit more um, agreement, where kind of the number one skill that courses were trying to teach was critique. Uh, followed by spotting issues, making arguments. Um, so a lot of this is just even learning to spot what the issues are and how to critically evaluate uh, kind of a, a piece of technology or a design proposal uh, to see uh, what could go wrong and what the, the, 